Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks to all the speakers this morning and this afternoon too. And uh, so we have um, come to the last part of uh, today. And uh, I, we start in this part with uh, my presentation of an uh, overview <laughs> of the key results, some of the key results of the, um, of the Immigration Observatory report for this year. So as some of you already know, we have been uh, uh, preparing this uh, report on the integration of immigrants, economic integration of immigrants in Europe for uh, a few years. And what we do is uh, every year we analyze the European Labour Force Survey to uh, take out a series of indicators of uh, labor market integration of immigrants across Europe. And uh, every year we replicate a series of uh, indicators and then we focus on one specific uh, topic in addition. And this year, uh, the topic is citizenship, which uh, fits very well with the topic of, uh, uh, of, uh, the, of the whole conference and all the papers that we've uh, um, listened to uh, today. So some of the, and I'm also happy because some of the issues that I want to touch uh, here have already been mentioned in the presentations that we've heard during the day. So let me first start with an overview of what the data of the European Labour Force Survey, so the re most recently available data of the EU LFS are uh, relative to year 2021, and they've just been released at the end of uh, 2022. The, uh, based on uh, the ULFS, the share of immigrants living in a European country is, a, is about 11%, where uh, our definition of immigrants is foreign-born. So uh, there's 11% of, the, of individuals living in a European country are foreign-born. The share increases to 14% in uh, the EU14 countries. And uh, Italy stands at around 10%, slightly below the European average and consistently below the, the EU14 average, so the average of the Western European countries. Uh, one characteristic, and that's also one uh, well-established characteristic of uh, the immigrant population in Europe, is that most uh, immigrants in Europe are, in fact, Europeans. So about one third uh, of, the, of the overall immigrants uh, living in Europe are from another European uh, country, so they are EU mobile citizens. And an additional 22% uh, originate from countries in Europe outside of the European Union. So this is a predominantly European immigration and well-established immigrant population. So most immigrants in Europe have lived in uh, their current country of residence for a long time. More than 85% of uh, immigrants currently living in European country have been in their current country of residence for uh, more than five years. The, um, when it comes to labor market integration of immigrants in Europe, this is uh, in, measured in terms of employment probability. This map reports with uh, warmer colors countries where the employment probability differential between immigrants and natives is higher, and with the colder colors, countries where the employment probability differential between immigrants and natives is, uh, is smaller. And as you can see, there's quite some variability. On average across Europe, the employment probability differential between immigrants and natives is uh, close to 10 percentage points. In Italy, the employment probability differential is, uh, is smaller, and that is something that those of you who have uh, listened to presentation of reports in previous years already know is largely due to the fact that the employment probability of Italian natives is, uh, is uh, lower to start with. So this is not to say that immigrants in Italy have an absolute advantage relative to immigrants in other countries, but they are less disadvantaged relative to uh, natives of, uh, of the country they live in. And that's uh, also the case, for instance, in uh, Spain, whereas in Sweden, the large employment probability gap between immigrants and natives is driven by and large by the fact that uh, Swedes have very high employment, uh, employment rates and, and uh, immigrants are unable to catch up to this uh, uh, very high labor force participation and employment probability. The fact that immigrants are less uh, likely than natives to have a job is not due or only in a very small part due to their individual characteristics. So even when we compare immigrants and natives with the same age, gender, education, 
profile, we still find that immigrants across Europe are 8.7 percentage points less likely than natives to, uh, to have a job. And what this graph is uh, plotting is the conditional versus the unconditional gap in employment probability across European countries. And as you can see, most countries lie around the 45 degrees line, meaning that there is not much of a difference between the uh, conditional and unconditional gap. Italy, if you want, is sort of a case of, 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 a, of, a, of a different case because the employment probability differential is small to start with, but it decreases by about one third when we um, we account for differences in uh, individual characteristics. So this basically means that the characteristics of the immigrant population in Italy, on average, make, make them less likely to have a job, make immigrants less likely to have a job uh, relative to natives. So they have characteristics that are less favorable to their integration in the Italian labor market. Um, so on top of uh, employment probability, Another important dimension for those who do have a job is the type of job that they perform. And what this graph here is showing is the distribution of immigrants and natives across broad occupational groups in, uh, across Europe. So in uh, red, we are reporting the proportion of immigrants, uh, of employed immigrants in each occupation group, whereas in blue, we have the proportion of natives employed in each occupation group. And, uh, Occupation groups are, are uh, ranked, more or less, in increasing order in terms of prestige and remuneration. So, uh, as you see, uh, something like 18% of, of employed immigrants perform an elementary occupation, and the same share is about 6% among uh, uh, European natives, whereas uh, the, pro the proportion of natives in the top occupational categories is much higher than that of immigrants. So, uh, immigrants tend to have lower employment probability and to be employed in a, uh, worse jobs, meaning less remunerated and less uh, prestigious jobs. Um, to what extent is the concentration of immigrants in, a, in, a, in, in less prestigious and less uh, skilled occupations due to their different characteristics, so to the fact that they may have different levels of education, they have different uh, age uh, and gender profiles, well, not to a very large extent. So in this uh, graph here, in these graphs here, we are decomposing the overall differential probability of being employed in an elementary occupation between immigrants and natives, so that's uh, the left-hand side uh, graph, so if the, the differential probability is about uh, 12 percentage point, we can explain something, about one-fifth of the overall differential probability of being in elementary occupation based on the age-gender education profiles, the differences between uh, uh, age-gender education profiles of immigrants with respect to natives, whereas the remaining 80 percent has to do with uh, immigrant status in itself. And uh, in terms of the probability of being employed in the three most highly skilled occupational categories, managers, professionals, or social professionals, or social professionals the, um, the role played by differences in individual characteristics is slightly higher, but even in the case, we can't explain more than one third of the overall differential probability of being in highly skilled occupation based only on observable characteristics of immigrants. So there's a, a sizable fraction of the occupational disadvantage of immigrants that's attributable to something else, so to immigrant status in itself. Um, so this is kind of a brief overview, a brief, brief update of the data that uh, we are uh, presenting, uh, I mean computing every year and uh, presenting every year, and you can find a much larger uh, set of indicators in the, in the report. What we are focusing on uh, this year is, uh, of, is on naturalization. And the reason why we're focusing on naturalization is because, as you, we have uh, heard in the first part of the day, naturalization seems to be a policy that is uh, likely to, to uh, improve the labor market outcomes of immigrants in, uh, in many settings. And we've seen in, uh, um, in most of the papers that have been presented today. And also because naturalization is a phenomenon that's very common in Europe. So last year, according to Eurostat, there have been uh, more than 100,000 uh, individuals 
who have acquired citizenship of a European country. So this graph here shows the evolution of naturalization between 2011 and 2021, broken down by different aggregation of European countries, but you see the trends are very similar. The number of naturalization has been more or less increasing over time, and the last year was the highest uh, recorded number of naturalizations since uh, uh, 2011, at least. The um, amount of the amount of naturalizations varies considerably across different European countries, and what we are reporting in this graph is the share, the average share of uh, non-citizens that acquire citizenship of their host country every year uh, between 2011 and 2021. So that's an average, an annual average over these 11 years. And as you, as you see, there is quite a significant degree of heterogeneity across the different European countries, with Sweden being the country that is uh, naturalizing higher, uh, the highest share of, uh, of immigrants every year. And on average, across Europe, the about 2.3% of uh, immigrants acquire citizenship of the host country every year. The um, difference in Italy in this case is pretty much in line with the European average. So the, the natural, as, as you can see, the Italian bar is exactly in line with the EU14 EU average. However, these huge uh, differences in flows of naturalizations and in the past flows of naturalization, even before 20, 2011 are reflected in the large differences in the share of a resident foreign born in each country who have the citizenship of the host country. And this is um, reported in this map where we, um, we have painted in blue and in cold colors countries with the highest share of citizens out of the whole foreign born population and with a, a scale of orange and red countries where the share of, uh, not, of uh, foreign born individuals with citizenship of those country is, uh, is lowest. And as you can see, there's a, in, in general a higher a share of a naturalized citizens in a central and northern European countries uh, rather than in, the, uh, in southern European countries. Here we're focusing, something that I forgot to, um, to stress, we are focusing here for this, for, um, to, to, to make the comparison more fair across countries, we are focusing only on immigrants who have been in the country for at least 10 years. So that's what we are calling uh, long-term residents. And for the rest of the presentation, we'll only focus on long-term long immigrants. Why am I doing that? Because as, again, we've heard uh, many times uh, this morning, and I come back to that also very soon, all countries impose some times of minimum residency requirements for uh, immigrants to um, access naturalization, and uh, 10 years is, in, uh, in uh, all cases, except for uh, Switzerland, if I'm not uh, wrong, the maximum numbers of, year of uh, minimum residency requirements. So basically, we are comparing a population of immigrants who are all potentially eligible for uh, naturalization. And in Europe, uh, on average, overall, 53% of immigrants who have been in, the, in uh, the country for at least 10 years have a citizenship of the country they live in. In Italy, this share is around 35%. So Italy has a, a flow of uh, new citizens that's comparable to that of other, uh, to that of other countries in terms of a share of the foreign-born population, but the stock of uh, foreign-born citizens is much lower. And uh, it's the same level, more or less, as, uh, as Spain. Why are there these cross-country differences? There are, of course, many, many reasons why countries differ in uh, the share of naturalized long-term migrants that have to do with the history of migration in the country, with the average uh, duration of stay in the country of the migrant population. But some of these might also be policy-driven, as again, we have seen in different papers in different contexts today. So what I'm doing in this graph is I'm, report, I'm uh, plotting the share of naturalized immigrants uh, in each country in 2021 against the average residency requirement that they faced uh, uh, in the country. So this measure of average residency requirement 
in, accounts for the fact that immigrants arrive at different points in time, in, uh, in, even in the same country, may have faced different uh, uh, residency requirements because the legislation changes over time. As you can see, there is a pretty clear negative correlation between the share of naturalized immigrants and the length of residence requirement. And according to, the, uh, to these uh, estimates, so the slope of this fitted line indicates that on average, one additional year of residence requirement is associated with a four percentage point decrease in the probability of, uh, um, of naturalization in the, in the share of immigrants uh, with the citizenship of the host country. So this seems to indicate, at least at a uh, face value, that the, that the naturalization policy matters. So by varying this uh, margin of residency requirement, we may induce more or less immigrants to naturalize. And remember, these are all immigrants who potentially have already satisfied this, uh, this residency requirement. Who is more likely to naturalize? That's another, uh, um, that's another issue. So as, we have, uh, as uh, we have seen, naturalization is not equally common for everyone. The cost of naturalizing may vary. The anti-benefits of naturalization may also vary. So on average, the, uh, what we are seeing in this graph is the share of a naturalized uh, immigrants, so of citizens, um, of foreign-born individuals with host country citizenship by uh, sex, and you see that the share of naturalized immigrants is higher among women than among men, and by origin, and the, the difference between EU and non-EU migrants in uh, their share of naturalized uh, citizens is uh, significantly different, so it's the, the share of non-EU migrants who acquire citizenship is much higher than among EU migrants, and also there is somehow an educational gradient in a share of naturalizations. That's, uh, that's pretty clear from, uh, from these graphs. So the next question is basically, this, is, this has to do with selection into naturalization, with uh, who decides to naturalize. Let's, we can now see if naturalization is associated with any differential labor market outcomes. And what this uh, graph shows is differential probability of employment for naturalized and non-naturalized immigrants uh, on average across Europe between 2010 and uh, 2021. And as you can see, although the values fluctuate a bit over time, the naturalized immigrants are always more likely to, have, to be in employment relative to non-naturalized immigrants. So that's uh, pretty clear for this graph. And actually, although the naturalization, the employment naturalization premium seems to have declined throughout the first part of the year 2010, then it has picked up again in recent years. Now, the, the big question is what was hinting since the very beginning um, of this day, um, Giorgio, in his uh, introductory speech, that there's, a, there's a, of course, the decision to naturalize might be itself a function of uh, some uh, variables that are also associated with better labor market outcomes. So what we are doing in uh, this uh, orange line is to con uh, compare immigrants, uh, naturalized and non-naturalized immigrants who have all been in the country for more than 10 years, so that's our sample in this case, but who also have the same age, gender, education, uh, area of origin, and years of residence. Okay, so these are and more com so we're comparing immigrants with other immigrants who are very similar to themselves, except that they don't have uh, citizenship. The employment uh, naturalization premium decreases a bit, but it is still there. And of course, we can't rule out that there are other variables that determine, so that those who are more motivated to work decide to naturalize. That's uh, fair, but still we are now comparing a, a much more uh, similar group of immigrants, okay? So to some extent, this might be driven by favorable selection into naturalization, but still it indicates that there, it is likely that there is something to naturalization in itself that drives better labor market outcomes. And this becomes uh, uh, even more evident, I believe, when we look at uh, the employment premium, differing, uh, at, uh, how the employment premium differs between immigrants uh, with different characteristics. So if we compare the employment authorization premium for uh, men and women, as you can see in this graph here, 
so this, these two um, uh, bars, the, the gain from naturalization is much higher for women than it is for men. And this is, also, this is uh, remarkable because women will also start from a lower employment probability. So they have a higher increase in percentage points in their employment probability starting from a lower baseline. So that means in percentage terms, the effect is even, the effect is even larger. So women seem to have uh, to gain more from, uh, or naturalization is associated with a higher employment probability for women than it is for men. And the same when we contrast EU migrants with non-EU migrants. EU migrants have basically no, uh, like naturalization for EU migrants is not associated to statistically significant employment probability increase, whereas for non-EU migrants, the increase in employment probability is sizable. And as you can see now, for each category of migrants, we have uh, uh, two types of estimates. Those, the unconditional estimates, that are the, where we are conditioning out all observable characteristics. And as you see, that does, it, that does change a bit, but not dramatically. So the, the point is still there. Non-EU migrants even take into account differences in their education and uh, age and in years of residence have a much more to uh, naturalization for non-EU migrants is associated to a much higher employment probability than it is for EU migrants. So um, the, um, if, we, if we look instead at the heterogeneity by education, the, the picture here is a bit different. See, if we focus on the triangles, on the estimates, on the triangles, the conditional estimates, so when we are comparing migrants with other migrants with similar characteristics, as you can see now, the, the uh, naturalization premium is pretty much the same for both low, intermediate, and highly educated migrants, which is remarkable because low educated migrants has much, have much lower employment probability to start with than highly educated migrants. So that means that in percentage terms, those who gain the most are the low educated. So basically, if we uh, summarize the takeaway message from this slide is that among categories that have a lower labor market outcomes to start with, naturalization is associated with a much larger uh, improvement of labor market outcomes than for categories who have uh, already um, relatively better labor market outcomes. Um, if we look at the type of jobs then that uh, naturalized and non-naturalized immigrants perform, we can uh, observe that naturalized immigrants are more likely to have a high pay, high skill job relative to non-naturalized immigrants. So naturalized immigrants here are uh, represented by, so the distribution of naturalized immigrants across different occupational groups is represented by these uh, red bars, whereas non-naturalized immigrants are represented by the blue bars. And as you see, the share of non-naturalized immigrants in elementary occupation is uh, twice as high as the share of naturalized immigrants. And uh, conversely, for the most high-skilled occupation, naturalized immigrants are uh, overrepresented relative to non-naturalized immigrants. When, again, we distinguish between uh, uh, men and women, in this case, the, the role of individual characteristics seems to be larger. So the difference between the unconditional and conditional estimates is, uh, uh, is large. So it can explain about half of the naturalization premium in occupational uh, status. But still, we observe that for women, the, the premium is higher than it is for, uh, for immigrant men. Of course, occupation is, a, is a, an important determinant also of, uh, of income. And what this, um, this graph here shows is the distribution of naturalized, the solid red line, and non-naturalized, the dashed uh, blue line, uh, immigrants, long-term immigrants across different the size of the national income distribution of their country of residence. And what you can see very clearly for, from, uh, this, uh, from this graph is that non -natural, the naturalized immigrants have a pretty flat distribution. So they are more or less evenly distributed across different the size of national income distribution. Um, so which means that they are at all across the income distribution, whereas non-naturalized immigrants are disproportionately concentrated at the bottom and less concentrated at the top of the distribution. This is something that, uh, that, is, uh, that happens 
that has always happened. So that's always uh, been the case uh, for all years between 2010 and 2020, although there seems to be somehow an increase in the income premium recent years. So what you what you're plotting on the top part of this graph is the differential probability of being in the uh, top 30 percent of the national income distribution for naturalized versus non-naturalized immigrants, and the bottom part of the graph, the differential probability of being in the bottom the side of the national income distribution with naturalized and non-naturalized income. And as you see, basically, the, 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 the two differentials are solidly there, and if anything, there's somehow an, even in, uh, an increase of these differentials in, uh, in 2020. Ah, I should specify that 2020 is the last year for which we have income information in the European Labor Force Survey. That's why we're using 2020 rather than 2021 for the income analysis. Also in this case, if we um, zoom in and uh, try and uh, understand whether the naturalization premium differs across different uh, uh, in, across immigrants with different characteristics, we find a similar pattern to what uh, we have seen before. So the um, the naturalization premium, if you see the probability of being the differential probability of being in the bottom of the side, is uh, much uh, uh, stronger between uh, naturalized and non-naturalized immigrants. is much stronger for. Uh, for women than it is for men, but interestingly, when we look at the top part of the distribution, there is no conditional and observable characteristics, there is no in increasing probability of being in the top three income decides for women, while it is also it is all there for men. So somehow the effect of a citizenship is asymmetric for men and women in terms of uh, part of the income distribution. So it's the women at the bottom who benefit the most, they move out of the bottom part of the income distribution, whereas it's uh, men at the top who benefit the most from uh, naturalization. Um, instead, for EU and non-EU migrants, we have the usual pattern of a higher advantage for uh, non-EU migrants than for uh, EU. And finally, if we look uh, at the effects by education, the fact that the the estimates in percentage point are, uh, um, are uh, similar when we look at the top three different size and are uh, stronger for low, low educated and uh, lower for the highly educated. When you look at the bottom of the size, have to be always taken, have to be interpreted, taking into account that the probability of being in the bottom of the size for the low educated is higher and the probability of being in the top three decides for the located is much lower. So in percentage term, the increasing probability of being in the top three decides is much higher for the low educated than for the high educated. So again, they benefit the most. And in terms of probability of being in the bottom part of distribution, when you take into account the difference in the baseline, the effect is pretty much the same for everyone. So, we have seen before that immigrants tend to have worse jobs. We have seen uh, so naturalized immigrants tend to have uh, better jobs than, uh, than uh, non-naturalized immigrants. And we have seen that they tend to have a higher income relative to the non-naturalized. Now we can put together the two and try and uh, um, decompose the overall differential in the probability of being in the bottom income size or the, the top three income decides between naturalized and non-naturalized immigrants into the part that's due to individual characteristics, so to the fact that those who decide to acquire citizenship in those countries may be different in many, in many respects, and we know that they are because we have seen that there are uh, differences. As you see, the differences in individual characteristics in, the, in themselves, as you can see from this graph, explain very little of the differential probability of being at the bottom of the income distribution. Most of the effect, in fact, more than half of the um, income disadvantage, or in particular of the differential probability of being in the bottom, the side of the income distribution for uh, non-naturalized relative to naturalized income is explained by the type of job that they perform, by the occupation that they manage to access uh, relative to those without uh, citizenship. And there's uh, about, uh, slightly more than one third of the overall differential that is, this is neither explained by individual, by individual characteristics nor by occupation, okay? So that means that even within the same broad occupation group, there is still an income disadvantage 
uh, for natural for non uh, naturalized income related to the naturalized. When we look at the probability of being a top three size, the picture is similar, although now occupations explain uh, individual characteristics plus occupation can explain a, a larger share of the overall differential, and the unexplained part is only 12 percent. And uh, so, to conclude, the um, so what we've seen, um, what, what are the key takeaway messages from uh, this year's report? So first of all, we have documented that immigrants in Europe have a I mean, they, they present a widespread employment disadvantage relative to natives. That is uh, true in, uh, in uh, most countries. Although I should uh, mention, the, if you want the encouraging uh, finding, is that this employment probability differential is, reduced, is reducing with respect to the one in previous year. So the previous year, the COVID year 2020, the, the differential had increased more than in the past. And now it, there is some sign that it is starting to reduce a bit. So we'll see next year what happens, whether that this encouraging trend continues or not. We've also seen that the gaps, uh, the employment, the labor market gaps are lower for naturalized migrants relative to the non-naturalized migrants. So there is a naturalization uh, premium. This premium is higher for women and for the new migrants. And the difference in the dual characteristics of migrants who naturalize and non-naturalize do not explain the whole naturalization premium away. So there is possibly a role for uh, naturalization itself. As I say, it's maybe not, I, I cannot claim precisely a causal effect here, but that there, this might be an indication that the causal effect of naturalization uh, does actually uh, exist. And this is also based on what we've seen uh, uh, today from many presentation. It looks like naturalization uh, premium does, a causal effect of naturalization does actually exist. And if one additional thought that uh, comes from these uh, findings is that policy, naturalization policy matters. So as you have seen, the playing around with length of residence requirement affects the degree to which immigrants are naturalized. So this might be a way in which governments may interfere with the probability of naturalization. And if naturalization has actually a, cost, a, a causal effect on uh, labor market integration, then it looks like it could be a relatively costless integration policy that's available to host country governments. Thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. So now I think Claudia and Guido, you can probably both come to the, to the desk. Thank you uh, very much for uh, um, this, uh, this presentation, for uh, the invitation um, to, this, um, to this conference, uh, and also for, uh, uh, for the presentations uh, I have listened uh, to today. Um, to, to start uh, my, my role as the discussant, I will start, uh, uh, I will uh, recall the conclusions uh, of uh, your report uh, where you say that um, naturalizations can be considered a cost-effective integration policy and you make a plea for policy changes uh, in uh, this respect. And I think uh, these conclusions uh, and uh, the work uh, presented in this report are um, a nice ending word uh, to the presentations um, of today and uh, to work that has been already done on uh, um, the effect uh, of uh, open uh, citizenship configurations uh, on uh, naturalization propensity and uh, uh, as a consequence of naturalization on uh, socioeconomic integration. Um, having accepted this, uh, uh, the question is, however, if uh, uh, policies and individual characteristics uh, 
are uh, uh, everything. Or if uh, uh, integration is uh, through naturalization, is if the naturalization integration nexus, which was actually the, the topic uh, of this, this conference today, is only about uh, policies and uh, um, um, individual characteristics. So, um, put it differently, um, what about uh, um, the migrants' perspective? And uh, if uh, integration is to be conceived uh, also as uh, a sense of belonging to something, of being part of something, then uh, um, the, um, the migrants, what migrants actually think about naturalization or what citizenship means to them uh, is actually um, a crucial complementary perspective to what uh, we have uh, listened today. Uh, at the end of the day, um, citizenship is about uh, the relationship between uh, still the relationship between the individual and the state. And uh, it should and it is important also to understand what uh, uh, this relationship means to migrants that decide or not uh, to naturalize. It is not a new question. I mean, Christian Jopke in a paper in 2007 uh, wrote, uh, citizenship is many things uh, to many people. And uh, several researchers have uh, written about uh, the need to um, understand uh, the, uh, cities, the naturalization integration nexus uh, um, um, uh, beyond uh, policies, uh, to look at uh, the um, considerations and uh, um, the, the motivations of migrants. And actually, we have uh, um, uh, several several works on this. There are empirical works uh, that try to delve uh, into the instrumental considerations of migrants. And they see really that migrants make you know, um, consideration about the opportunities that uh, naturalization have for them, uh, completely disconnected from any sense of belonging. And then we have studies that uh, Mm, just to mention one, the work by uh, Sofia uh, Apketar on uh, uh, citizenship acquisition in the US and Canada that uh, consider also the other side, the emotional attachment and the subjective meanings of citizenship for naturalized and, uh, or naturalizing immigrants. And finally, we have some nice, very recent works uh, uh, published in Italy about uh, the powerful force of procrastination. I mean, there are immigrants that uh, actually could naturalize, but don't, because they are uh, intolerant toward bureaucracy, because they are lazy, or simply because they want to protest against the situation through this not naturalization, uh, against the situation that uh, uh, they feel, uh, or a legislation that they actually perceive uh, as unfair. So, uh, it is actually this perspective, this compl complementary perspective, is uh, an under-researched field, but it is not an unexplored field. But it needs, uh, I think, uh, um, um, some more, uh, some more consideration, especially if uh, we are talking about uh, the uh, naturalization integration nexus. Um, you connecting this uh, question, this research question, to what uh, we have uh, listened to today, it is about uh, to look into what, if I may borrow your words, uh, Julia, uh, the stochastic variable which uh, we call love. I mean, with, uh, to look into the emotional attachment, the subjective perception to what is, uh, to the relationship that is uh, constructed uh, with the state uh, through naturalization. So, uh, just uh, to connect also again to the report which puts actually uh, or shows, uh, among other southern European countries, 
the case of uh, Spain as one of the countries that has contributed to, um, to, to, to increase the overall number of naturalizations in, uh, um, in, uh, in Europe. I would like to show some uh, slides. Uh, actually, so thank you, <laughs> so that uh, you, you understand uh, um, what, uh, what actually I'm talking about. So this is uh, the case of Spain, and the case of Spain is interesting, and I'm connecting again to your report because I don't really, well, this is a question I have. If you define long-term residency as a status or as the time that uh, migrants are have been de facto resident in a country. Because Spain in this respect is quite interesting, it is an asymmetric citizenship regime. The general rule to obtain citizenship is 10 years, but uh, uh, citizens from the former colonies can obtain the citizenship after two years of residence. It means that in Spain you get citizenship, you, if you are a Latin American or a Filipino, you can get uh, the citizenship or apply for citizenship be before being an, a long-term resident because the requirement is five years for long-term residency. So it is a, an exceptional rule which in uh, Spain applied to about 30% of the foreign population. This rule has been the engine of the uh, uh, Spanish naturalization machine and explains part of, uh, uh, of the figures presented in the report. But uh, um, the other fact is uh, interesting. You can see among uh, those that uh, um, can naturalize faster in Spain, there are differences in the naturalization rates. I'm not going, the, the peaks you see here for Ecuadorians, for instance, have administrative reasons. I, I'm not going into the detail of this. But in general, you can see that, uh, for instance, there is uh, a different propensity, or uh, there are quite different rates uh, among uh, Ecuadorians and uh, Filipinians uh, who are subject uh, to the same exceptional rule. So we are, um, I mean, both, together we, with people from Venezuela, can naturalize after two years of uh, uh, legal uh, residency, but the rates are different. So what we have tried to do, or we are trying to do uh, in our uh, research project uh, is to um, go more into detail in understanding why migrants naturalize or not, if, uh, even if they have the possibility to do so. And we have tried also to understand uh, what does, beyond all regulations, uh, what actually citizenship means to them. And what we have seen, uh, I mean, we have still to extend, we have 50 interviews, we have to extend the number, but uh, what we have seen is that, of course, uh, opportunity structures better. But there is also, in the migrants we have interviewed, there is also a sense that uh, if they get uh, if they get the citizenship, when they get the citizenship, part of them feel more integrated. So I, I'm naturalized now, I'm really part of it. And uh, um, this uh, is, is something that they really express as uh, a matter of feeling. That is why I was uh, recalling uh, the, or um, um, uh, mentioning the, 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 um, the quotation of uh, of uh, this morning about the stochastic variable uh, we call lab. But uh, the second, uh, um, I, uh, the second uh, interesting point is that migrants, uh, this is, uh, it, it, it seems like there is no more a kind of loyalty feeling that uh, citizenship is completely disconnected from a sense of loyalty, duty, or a recognition. This, is, this, this does not seem true. I mean, those that get the citizenship, what, what we have seen as in part among, not everybody, but there is the idea that I'm really now a part of this society. Before I felt under-evaluated under or um, I feel more settled. 
And uh, um, the most interesting, in my opinion, the most interesting uh, aspect is that they also develop uh, a kind of sense of duty. Now that I am naturalized, uh, I have really to behave well because, uh, for instance, uh, some mentioned uh, I am, um, uh, I, I, I owe a great debt uh, to Spain. This, however, is only one, a part of the story. So we have this positive and everybody's happy and uh, uh, they don't feel immigrants anymore because uh, uh, I have now, and there is the question of dual nationality, but uh, if you are an immigrant, you are less. Uh, now I feel like expert. So this, this, this fact that naturalization is able to delete the perception of being an immigrant. We have observed this. Um, Yet, this is only one part of the story. The other part is that uh, this is not true for everybody. And here we have the Filipinians, where uh, they actually, uh, they, they, in, among Filipinians, the perception of being uh, from the phenotype different mm -hmm. and to speak uh, not Spanish as uh, Ecuadorians uh, has been, uh, or also in the case of Brazilians, uh, has appeared as something that despite having acquired the citizenship still makes them feel less integrated, less part of society. This is uh, the, the, the perception of discrimination which has, was observed uh, of course, uh, in the quantitative study in Nepalese study by Porters in 1986, and it is, it is, it is there. And then uh, um, the fact that uh, um, there is since, uh, see, still uh, in many of them a kind of attachment to the country uh, of origin in comparison to the country of uh, destination. But I think the most interesting part is the fact that uh, uh, the procrastination. I mean, today we have listened to a kind of uh, yes, no, no, naturalized, not naturalized, but actually what <laughs> happens to them that can, could, but they don't, and why? And uh, what, what, what we have uh, uh, listened to is uh, really, this is a complex uh, constellation of uh, identity, uh, questions is it is uh, um, a laziness, the paperwork. Mm? If I I don't want uh, I don't feel that because I have to work. I have uh, there's a life situation with or even for a Moroccan uh, uh, young man that, that says when I go to Morocco, actually only I I, I feel okay with my long term residency. And all this paperwork is actually uh, too much to me. What I'm trying to say with this, uh, um, uh, with this final word and uh, to connect it uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to what has been said today and to the report uh, presented by Tommaso is that I th my plea is uh, that if we want uh, to understand the uh, naturalization integration nexus, actually we should embed uh, the question in a more holistic, complex uh, constellation of, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of perspective. The importance, uh, undeniable, of the citizenship uh, configurations, the unquestionable relevance uh, of individual characteristics. Mm, we have all today, I think, the most interesting finding, uh, what uh, has been strengthened by the presentation uh, by Tommaso, of Tommaso is the different, the gender difference. And, but, um, I know uh, I'm talking here to economists mainly, but also the perspective of uh, migrants, uh, what actually migrants uh, think about uh, what uh, they are doing or why they are doing. And maybe this adding, uh, this perspective could help uh, to clarify what uh, cannot be explained. Uh, this 37% uh, uh, that uh, uh, cannot be uh, explained uh, through um, the individual characteristics, maybe it could uh, help to understand the differences uh, in, uh, marriage, in marriage patterns uh, 
uh, presented uh, today by Julia, if it matters, uh, if it also it is a matter of age, or uh, of uh, um, uh, of the the the, 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 the mating patterns uh, that might be behind certain uh, certain decision, or it could also um, explain the difference uh, uh, the different uh, perception of uh, dual citizenship in uh, uh, even though uh, dual citizenship. Uh, uh, is actually uh, something uh, possible. So these are, uh, with this uh, final uh, um, uh, final word, uh, I thank again for your uh, for your contribution, and uh, it was a, a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Okay, um, I think that the, the ways in which um, today's workshop has been structured is um, particularly interesting to me uh, for um, biographical reason, autobiographical reason. Uh, so we had like a series of papers in the morning that were uh, mostly academic in their conception and methodology and communication style. And, um, uh, and I come from, uh, yeah, let's say, in, in my past, I've, I've done mostly academic work, uh, research focused and center type of work. And um, what, especially of migration, uh, migration studies and citizenship, and um, what I noticed in the field of migration studies has been that at certain point in the uh, 2000, 2010, there's been the so-called local turn in, uh, in, the, uh, in the focus, in the main focus on the main approach of looking at how migration was uh, managed and uh, integration was uh, looked at. And I think that more recently we have, if I may, uh, a quantitative turn in migration studies. Uh, I remember that at the beginning of uh, my uh, studies on migration, et cetera, economists were always like a, a very, very uh, few people, and they were focusing mostly on labor market integration, on differential wages, uh, on uh, gravity models to understand how uh, the flows were, uh, could be possibly explained by these uh, wages differentials or labor market needs. Uh, using these gravity models. And um, more recently, and I think it's a blessing, there's been like a, 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 um, an increasing involvement of uh, economists, but also quantitative social scientists using uh, data as their first uh, source of uh, uh, inquiry. And, um, and, I, and I think that this is uh, definitely uh, uh, a very good uh, sign that the, the, the field of migration studies is, is, is developing, but also maturing. Um, however, what I noticed in the discussion also of this morning, and we, we saw how the, 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 the realms, the domains that were approached by the various contributions was uh, very varied. Um, I think that, and based, I base this also on, on, not only on this morning experience, but you know, on consolidated experience, alas, uh, that is, uh, there is still some, some, some steps to be done in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, bridging the barriers between disciplines. Uh, and this is uh, particularly needed, for example, uh, Claudia, has, has expressed some of these uh, aspects that should be probably more integrated when we talk about some specific subjects in terms of considering also the literature coming from other disciplines. And I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers. I mean, I'm, I'm saying that it's a mutual, let's say, exercise that should be done uh, by more, let's say, qualitative uh, approaches and the quantitative, but there should be like a much more uh, integration and exchange to become more effective. 
And for example, in, this, uh, in the analysis that we, we seen this morning, and Claudia was mentioning some aspects of citizenship that are not, that are not captured by data or, by, or cannot be measured, but still are relevant, especially when you draw your conclusion or you create your assumptions to construct, you know, to, to, to build your, uh, your models, your, um, your uh, scientific contribution. Um, but there's a, like a, another aspect that is instead it's, it could be measurable that is exactly linked and it, it, it has to do with the interaction between the immigrant status. So the fact that m in, in many countries, especially in Western countries, migrants enjoy many rights, many rights when they are, uh, you know, uh, legally residing in a country. And there was a, a legal, um, a lawyer uh, in the US that wrote several contributions about the devaluation and revaluation of citizenship uh, that is attached not only to this, but also to the fact that uh, at a certain point, immigrants enjoyed so many rights that it didn't become, didn't make much of a difference to naturalize because the only rights that they were left without was the political rights. Um, so if I don't have a particular interest in participating in the elections, I, I might be very happy with all the rights that I enjoy as, a, as an immigrant uh, with a permanent status or not. And I think that this aspect could be factored in, in some of the analysis. It, of course, it requires uh, you know, uh, an effort to uh, systematize the, the knowledge between the uh, so variegated, you know, uh, platform of uh, differences across the European countries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but then you can probably factor this in. Um, but then I was saying that it's um, it's kind of uh, autobiographic this morning because I mean the the the, the style of the of the dissemination of the. Um, of the um, of the workshop, uh, because then I transitioned to um, to working mostly um, for the institutions as a as a researcher within the European Commission, and I think that you know the report is a is a clear example of an hybrid type of publication that is based on scientific and uh, academic work, but it aims and it wishes to reach out to a larger audience and it also tries to interact with the policy side. Um, for the last six years I've worked for this uh, Knowledge Center on Migration and Demography of the European Commission. I will spend like a few minutes to explain what this is because I'm sure that it's not known. Um, the, J the JRC, the Joint Research Center, is a, d a Directorate General of the Commission and uh, um, it's uh, the in-house uh, science service of the commission and its mission is to provide uh, you policies with independent evidence-based scientific and technical support throughout the whole policy cycle. So it's not just the Knowledge Center on Migration and Demography, but we covered as GRC all the policy uh, domains that uh, the commission operates on. Um, this center was established in 2016, which is uh, a date that should ring a bell to many. So in the middle of the um, uh, migration, uh, so-called migration refugee crisis. Because the commission wanted to have um, a center that, uh, that provided some, some insights. Um, and um, what the kind, the kind of uh, um, institutional setting that, that is uh, at place here is interesting because there's a meeting, there's a, sorry, a steering um, group uh, where we have all these, those policy DGs, as we call them in the commission, represented at the table. So basically, on paper, this should be like um, the ideal uh, setting to, to, to start, let's say, uh, a dialogue between the policy side and the researchers. Uh, what we do then, we provide like a series of um, uh, reports or uh, we try to identify knowledge gaps, produce analysis, 
um, and then we, we, look, we look and we use a lot, a lot of data. Um, and I will get back, I will come back to this aspect especially. Uh, we have some tools that are uh, of free access and uh, are available to be used by researchers, stakeholders, policymakers, also at uh, member state level. Um, and for example, the Atlas of Migration, uh, which is coming out in the uh, 2022 edition in these days, is um, as a wealth of uh, data set behind it that are uh, updated automatically as soon as Eurostat releases the new updates. So I invite you to explore those. Um, and, I'm, and, the point, and I put the accent about data. So what I found, I'm a political scientist, I'm a social scientist by background. When I got to the, to the, to the center, I found um, a prevalence of people who were able to crunch a lot of data to create very complex and refined models to try to understand and to provide information to uh, the policymakers. And here I'm, I go back to what I was telling before, that there's a quantitative turn in the academia as well on migration, etc. And I think that this, what I observed at least, is that there's been like um, a higher interest from the policymakers to oversimplify at some point uh, complex realities through the use of data, because there's this kind of, let's say, a little bit naive idea that data uh, are, uh, you know, uh, um, not only, um, let's say, a, a trustworthy description of uh, the reality, but they are also very uh, useful in the public debate, in the public discourse, because they kind of convey and project uh, uh, knowledge, uh, being knowledgeable about one aspect. And I think that one of the uh, main aspects that in, in the quantitative, let's say, turn that I uh, think it's been, has been, has characterized the, the, the migration studies is to be aware of this risk. When we uh, communicate, when we talk to policymakers, we need to be very, very uh, clear and very, let's say, um, almost didascalic to, to explain how data uh, are uh, created, because they don't grow on trees, but they are created and they are collected according to a rationale, to a, a, a need, to categories that are defined uh, following uh, some specific, sometimes, uh, the political um, uh, goals and uh, objectives. And this should be never for, forgotten when it's, for example, in, in the contest, even like today, we, we try to convey which are the results uh, and the main findings of uh, even academic papers like uh, this morning. Um, and then, the problem is also that this kind of uh, dialogue that has been, in a way, I think it's, it's, been, it's become increasingly uh, sought uh, uh, by the Commission, for example, with the uh, evidence uh, um, and the, the knowledge production uh, um, community. It never happens in a void, even when it happens in, under the Chatham House rules so it's just a very safe environment that you have like experts and policymakers sitting together and then you can gloves off, try to uh, deal with the issues at stake in a, in a very candid and uh, blunt manner. The public debate is always there. It's always there because us as researchers, we have our own ideas, we have our own opinions, of course, but we are not like choosing our arguments, our topics, our um, uh, main interest in research, uh, maybe without, um, you know, uh, independently from the public debates, and even more so policymakers are uh, coming with a big burden uh, on their shoulders about what the public debate is discussing about and how they use the, the, the knowledge that they gather uh, 
uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the public debate and which are going to be the costs or the consequences um, selecting or uh, adopting some, um, some uh, choosing some, 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 time, some, some types of knowledge instead of other. And, um, and here I come to, um, for example, um, to this book, which is very useful by uh, Christina Boswell, and then she wrote extensively also later on. This is from 2009, but there are also some updated versions of this book, which is a great uh, and extended reflection upon how uh, this interface between policy makers and uh, researchers work and what kind of, uh, um, uh, let's say, dynamics are in, uh, in, in, in entailed in this kind of relationship, which are the risks, which are, which are the opportunities. And, um, and I, you know, I think that it should be um, a reading for all of us who want to be, uh, like, let's say, to have like um, an impact in, uh, in, uh, through our work, scientific work in um, uh, in, in policy making, and then I I, I I just close my 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 quick you know um, considerations on with an example for example from 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 the from the report uh, Tommaso for example you have a very the LFS survey is a is an incredible um, uh, source uh, of. Uh, information and data about labor participation, of course, and you are able to do a lot of interesting quantitative, robust quantitative work with that source. And um, I think that, for example, in your report, I really like that you, you and your co-authors, at some point, you kind of uh, uh, correlated uh, the levels of uh, education in the receiving country with the level of education in the from of the immigrants coming from from outside this year is the european years of skills and uh, i encourage you to be more proactive when you present this report it's, uh, for example and also this part about skills and how you know these are linked to some you know uh, um, larger reasons, I mean, apart from these uh, simple correlations, which is already, though, very striking and telling. Um, but I encourage you to kind of connect when you, when you can be more proactive in connecting these kind of findings to what, for example, the Commission is uh, focusing on, uh, you know, in, uh, during the year. Uh, because I'm sure that, that this would be of great interest for, uh, for many policymakers throughout the 2023, and I leave it here. Thank you. Thank you. So, I, so we open the floor. Sure. I th we, we, may, we may take some questions before. Thank you, Tommaso. It's a very interesting report, and I think that the, really the evidence on naturalization is very interesting, and uh, also it, it's, it comes out very well after all the papers today that somehow try to, as we discussed this morning, no, to try to uh, identify issues of self-selection in becoming a native and the characteristics of natives, and I think everything matches very well. There are some issues that, that really come to my mind which are really interesting. I think, I mean, your main conclusion is that somehow a good policy could be to shorten the period of naturalization, no? because you have evidence that the more restrictive and the, lo the, the longer is the natur naturalization process, okay, the worse are the labor, out uh, the labor uh, outcome. And, uh, and therefore, I think there is a very clear message there on uh, really shortening and making easier the period of naturalization. Well, naturally, I presume there are, there are trade-offs no? in naturalizing too early or too late, no? because 
if you go in the other direction, maybe you may end up naturalizing too early. No, we don't know what could be the effects of naturalizing too early. No, that uh, it could have uh, effects on future migration flows. It can have effects on really how far really people that are naturalized are really able to be integrated in society. Whatever reasons that could refrain a country or a state from naturalizing. So I think the first issue is really trying to identify a, what is the right trade-off between uh, uh, delaying or anticipating naturalization. The second issue, and it came from the discussion of Claudia to my mind, which is very interesting. It's interesting your, uh, what you reported on the perception of different migrants on naturalization. I wonder what is there, whether they change opinion, for example, on crucial factors, like, for example, on how open immigration policies should be you know, once they become naturalized or whether they change political opinions, whether they change attitudes towards other migrants. I think that is also a very interesting dimension that probably, I, probably, I don't know whether the literature is already exploring that. I presume there must be something on that, and that is certainly very interesting. Another dimension which is important, given that we're in Europe, is Europe, okay? Natu being naturalized as a Spanish or as an Italian or as a Greek means you are becoming a European citizen with all the rights that you have as a European citizen within Europe, okay? So I wonder whether this makes a difference compared to other naturalization in other countries, no? Now we, have the, we could have a great experiment with the UK, okay? UK is no longer Europe, okay? So maybe being naturalized in the UK is less worthy than it used to be because you no longer have access, free access to the European market. So it has changed completely the value of being naturalized if you take a European perspective. And maybe it's more worthy to be naturalized in, I don't know, in the Netherlands or in Germany or in Italy or in France than to be naturalized in the UK. And maybe this is something, this European, what it means becoming a European citizen, not only becoming a national of a given country, I think it's a very important dimension. And it's interesting to understand if, they, if the migrants, they acquire it, they achieve it, they get it. Do they get it? I don't know if they get it somehow, but if they have the perception of being really European. Giorgio, the problem here is that naturalization and citizenship is a very hot issue, extremely hot, because naturalization and citizenship is, has also a symbolic value. Oh, I remember when I used to be president of the Commission for the Integration of Immigrants that we had prepared, I'm thinking about, let's say, some more 20 years ago, we had prepared the first, well, the more important uh, project to change the nationality law in Italy. And this project included also reduction of the time of regular residence. Plus, of course, easing the procedure that concerned young immigrants coming to Italy, who came to Italy and studied Italy, and so on. Okay? Well, the project is still there. Why is it still there? Because naturalization is a strong symbolic issue. It means, are you in favor of immigration or are you against immigration? It's not just something that should be, let's say, considered as something of favor integration. Okay, that's it, sorry. Um, so you mentioned is, it, is this working? Okay. Uh, you mentioned a few uh, individual traits and characteristics that may lead migrants to uh, go on and select into uh, getting, applying for naturalizations. But I was wondering whether, whether in the report or in the uh, broader literature, um, there is any evidence that migrants also go through a process of selection of the destination country uh, of migration uh, based on that country's rules of naturalization. And I think that this is an important question because it can inform a relevant question from the point of view of policy, especially in this country actually, which is whether 
let's say, Italy or a country can increase the skill level of its migrant pool by easing up uh, the naturalization regime, by making it more easy for, uh, um, for migrants to acquire citizenship. So may I quickly respond to all those, to, so to the discussants, whom I thank both for their um, inputs and to the and to the questions. I'll be uh, quick in the interest of time because uh, we are almost running out of time. And the, so I mean, I totally agree with the with the fact that naturalization is a complex issue, and it, it, there's a lot of symbolic values attached to citizenship that go beyond the, the direct effect of citizenship as as we're trying to measure like in, in the report or in many of the papers that we have uh, seen today. So there's more to citizenship than simply like a, 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 catal a catalyst for economic integration or a, a passport for a better labor market outcomes. So in, in this sense, it is, um, it, I mean, whatever you've been, so in this sense, I believe, Giorgio, when you're saying that the, the trade-offs in terms of uh, easing naturalization or shortening requirements are not economic trade-offs, but I, I rather econo um, political and symbolic trade-offs. So I mean, it, 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 largely because there's a, so the cost from the economic point of view, like giving access earlier to citizenship, um, it's uh, hard to think that might be really harmful for Im from an immigrant integration point of view. There may be other type of uh, reasons why you don't want to do it, because then giving citizenship is also like allowing people to vote, to decide on uh, like a deliberate, participating in the deliberative process of a country, and you want them to be sufficiently attached to, the, to that country before they can decide on a country's laws. But from a purely economic point of view, I have, uh, that's something that I've been uh, um, thinking uh, about a while, and I don't, there is no obvious trade-off that, that I can see. But I agree that, uh, as uh, Claudia was also saying, I mean, the, the, it, it, I, I don't want to sort of uh, give the impression of uh, thinking of in a simplistic way as a, as a naturalization, as like as a naturalization tool, that you like, like that you decrease, you play around with the uh, residency requirements and that magically somehow increases integration. But that is part, so part of a broader package of uh, policies, and also, I mean, facilitating access to citizenship does not mean of forcing people to naturalize. It just means feeling, allowing people to naturalize if they want to, right? So that, that uh, also, I think, carries a symbolic value in itself, rather than, it, so the, the mere fact of uh, making it easier to acquire citizenship has a symbolic value also towards the migrants who may decide to uh, pick up that, uh, uh, that option. And uh, um, another, mm, another point that I think is, uh, that George, you raised, and uh, that I think is uh, very interesting, is uh, has to do with the EU citizenship being particularly uh, um, valuable because it allows you actually to move around the many countries. It doesn't only stabilize you in the country you live in. And in fact, UK citizenship has, uh, uh, is, a, is a case in. Uh, is an interesting case to study because now the UK citizenship is no longer giving you access to EU citizenship. And in fact, I mean, Martin has uh, worked on that. I mean, there, there's been an increase in naturalizations of uh, British nationals in EU countries, right? Because they, they want to gain access to better passports than the, the one that they, that they currently have. So, um, I mean, very briefly, and then I give the, the floor to Ferruccio for the conclusions. I, I, so what I believe is that also speaking to the point that Guido has raised, I, I agree also with, uh, with Guido about the possibility, I mean, the, and the, 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 the risk of using data-based uh, uh, evidence as a rhetoric tool to defend, uh, like to, in an opportunistic way to defend uh, potentially your policy decisions, but I think that's a risk that is worth taking, like the, the fact of uh, like, uh, going towards a larger use of data in uh, policy making is, uh, I, I see that, I mean, and also coming from a quantitative researcher and maybe uh, like self-interested, but it's a, it's, a, it's a useful step towards, I think, better policy making in general. And of course, we should be able and trained to 
um, shield from ourselves from a rhetorical use of data or selective use of data to defend uh, policy choices. So I think I will stop here and I'll give the uh, floor to Ferruccio. Ah, sorry, you have a question on the, on whether there is self-selection uh, of immigrants based on naturalization choices. Uh, the, the honest answer is I, I'm not aware of evidence of that. Uh, that's something that as economists I would certainly worry about and uh, in paper that Francesco has presented earlier but, mm, joined with me, we worry a lot about that and in fact, we, 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 we perform a lot of robustness checks removing uh, immigrants uh, to, that may have refugees, sorry, that may have self-selected into a country precisely because of, uh, of uh, generosity of, of naturalization policies by only looking at, uh, at uh, refugees and migrants and other migrants who have been uh, subject to policy changes while they were already in the country, so they couldn't possibly have uh, strategically chosen the country for uh, uh, for, for a more generous uh, citizenship acquisition policies. Thanks. Thank you, very much. Thank you, Tommaso. Good afternoon. Um, le let me start by thanking again Tommaso and Giorgio for keep keeping doing this and organizing this, which I, I really think is a very rare and valuable opportunity for interdisciplinary exchange on single, always crucial and well-chosen topics like this year. Um, my task is um, an awkward one uh, to, to try and boil all, all this down to reduce the wonderful complexity and richness of this dense day uh, to a few takeaway lessons, I guess. Uh, so sorry for having to do this. Um, yeah, um, let me try to sum up by you know singling out a few a few points really. Uh, one is very clear, in, in all the presentations, I would say, um, naturalization come, natu the, the reality of naturalization premium stands out very clearly. So it's, it's a solid reality, well backed by evidence. This, you know, is shown in, in, in very different way in some of, uh, uh, of uh, in several of, uh, of the presentations we had. Um, and, and I would also add that migrants seems to know this very well, seems to be, seem to be very aware of the existence of such a premium. Although I think that the uh, you know, qualifications uh, made by, by Claudia about reluctance to, to naturalize, procrastination are also very important because they m somehow mitigate or, or uh, match the, the awareness of the advantage with some other, you know, factor driving their choices, be it wedding choices or, or application choices in a, in a certain procedure. But still, the, the strategic uh, naturalization behaviors come out very clearly, and I would say undeniably from the evidence we were uh, presenting. Um, Another interesting aspect is, is, is that the premium uh, is especially high, and this is shown by several also of the presentations and by the report, for some hard to integrate groups uh, comparatively. So uh, refugees, women, non-EU, all in different ways, in different contexts, benefit more than average from naturalization. And this is also, you know, very interesting because it, it may indeed, you know, induce us to this naive belief that naturalization is a sort of magic uh, tool for integration, which is indeed not as much as this, right? And I'll get back to this, of course. Um, why is there such a thing, a naturalization premium? And I would, uh, you know, reduce explanations to three possible explanations that you collectively gave, uh, and I would call, the first is citizenship as an enabler, you know, uh, giving access to some sectors of the labor market, in particular public employment, but not only. Uh, citizenship as a motivator, you know, the security to stay, to be able to stay forever, potentially, in a country, in a place, you know, uh, gives you, encourages you to invest there, of course. And, and third, citizenship as a protector from discrimination, 
hmm, which is also something that was shown very interestingly by, by some of you. And, and these three you know, uh, match, I think, well with, uh, for instance, the three mechanisms that Christina was, was showing. Yeah. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a very, I think, consistent uh, set of uh, uh, statements, of, of conclusions that come, up, come out from the, the day. Um, so what about policy implications, uh, which was very you know, clearly stated in, in Tommaso's presentation and report? Um, yeah, the premium is apparently easy to reap uh, you know, facilitating acquisition of nationality is an easy reform on paper. Then I, I'll come to Giovanna's uh, remark, of course. But it's, it's quick to implement, I mean, what, from one day to the next, potentially, and it's cheap. At least in our polities, it's, it has become cheap because the um, Welfare benefits are, that are granted to long-term residents in EU countries are almost identical to those who are granted to, um, to, to, to nationals. Uh, so, yeah, then there is the political cost that, you know, a certain majority may suffer if all the naturalized voted for the other, you know, uh, political uh, group leaning. But this is, you know, uh, but if you only look at economic costs of the reform, it's a almost zero cost reform. So, so the question is raised, uh, obviously, is, is why aren't liberalizing policies approaches more pervasive? Why are there every year reverse trends, you know, regressive reforms, raising the number of years, for instance, or or reducing the number of years by com but compensating this with adding other requirements, criminal law, economic requirements, and so on and so forth. So to, to answer this, and I think I'm asking obvious questions, but I think it's useful to, to, you know, to make it clear. And, and uh, for, for answering this, the, the catalyst versus crown metaphor uh, by, by, I think it was Hein Müller that introduced it, um, but, but there are many other ways to characterize this, this dichotomy, uh, tool reward, uh, Yajna, I think, used the tool reward uh, dichotomy. Uh, so it's, it's a very interesting one. Uh, so some see, and here there are two ways of understanding the metaphor. One is a normative metaphor, so we want sit naturalization to be a facilitating factor for integration. We want to use it as such, a mean to, a, to an end, uh, and, and crown we want naturalization only to be a reward for the deserving ones. But there is also a more you know, analytical way to understand it, which is a bit what Tommaso used, and I think it may induce some confusion of having this double way of using the metaphor. But anyway, I'm using it from a normative point of view. Uh, first thing to say, uh, well, uh, there is no country that adopts a pure catalyst model or, or perhaps a pure crown model. So, in, in, uh, so these are essentially ideal types. Even countries that adopt a more radically the catalyst model, so using proactively uh, naturalization to promote integration, impose some crown requirement, no? do impose some years, in the rest, but also some you know, uh, sustainability, economic sustainability requirement and so on and so forth. So, so it's not a, a, a real dichotomy, right? It's, it's a spectrum. Uh, but having said this, uh, the dichotomy, I think, catches a real ideological polarization in our democracies, uh, you know, uh, two different ways of thinking about belonging. And, and, and essentially, as it was said, it depends on the symbolical value that is given to citizenship as such. You know? uh, is it just a mean to an end, or is it you know, a value in itself, something that... So, and here, the identity factor uh, comes in, I think, uh, powerfully. Um, so to, to conclude, and I will really 
I will really be, uh, you know, as brief as possible. A, a, a word on, on the research policy dialogue that was, you know, discussed by, by Guido. Is it a, really a dialogue of the deaf, as some of the remarks uh, seemed to suggest? And, in, and if so, why? Because uh, it's clear that, you know, the, the massive evidence that this day produces, if you want to have an impact, is, is not enough. <laughs> because this evidence has been piling up for years, even more and ever more, uh, you know, convincing and consistent, uh, but it, it hasn't changed the reality of the absence of a univocal trend toward liberalization. Uh, so I think that uh, if research aims, to the extent that research aims, and this is, of course, not forever, for everybody, but to have a policy impact, dissemination and advocacy should somehow incorporate also identity issues. Uh, and how to do it, I think this is a major uh, question uh, for qualitative, quantitative dialogue, probably, uh, and, you know, uh, finding, you know, creative ways to incorporate this in, in the picture and not leaving that just as an unexplained uh, box in, in the scheme. Uh, finally, uh, yeah, it's about identity, it's about, you know, subjective factors that are not only on the side of migrants, but also on the side of natives, including policy makers among them. Uh, but, but maybe we should also consider that that can be, and there is often, an economic rationality in not integrating, in keeping you know, segments, uh, in keeping the society and the labor market fragmented, segmented, um, for some employers and maybe their political pre representatives, the economic logic, the rationality of, of not you know, using naturalization for boosting integration can be there and is there, but this dark side of, of, you know, of uh, the integration discussion and the citizenship discussion I think is often neglected in, in research. Uh, it's, it's often mentioned in policy discussions in political debates, but then very hard to operationalize, I would say. But I think it would be, you know, really worth uh, operationalizing, and, and that's another area where I think uh, creativeness, creativity, uh, quality quantitative, uh, you know, uh, creativity could, could uh, you know, bring benefits. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Ferruccio, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, being here for this very interesting day. I would like to thank all the speakers and all the audience, and also I would like to thank all the people who made the, the day possible. So, first of all, Piero Bertino, who has helped me greatly with uh, uh, the preparation of the report, and Alessandro Ciardo, too. Chiara Elli for uh, organizing uh, flawlessly the, uh, this workshop together with Cinzia, with all the local team at College of Alberto, so Cinzia and her team, Alberto, Angelo, who made uh, the possible and the running of the conference very smooth. Thanks, uh, everyone.